Welcome everyone. Um, we're just having all the participants join. We will start very shortly. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining for Open Democracy's weekly live panel discussion. Um, I'm Mary Fitzgerald. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Open Democracy. Um, we are a global media outlet that seeks to challenge power and inspire change. Um, we have an absolutely fantastic panel today. Um, uh, and the reason we've convened it is because as journalists, it's our job to investigate all the bad stuff that's going on in the world. Right now, Open Democracy is reporting on all the um, terrible things that are happening, abuse of power and, and tragedy and loss of agency and obviously the health pandemic um, that's been consuming us um, in 2020. But we, 2020. But we also think it's our job to help people think about what could be done differently or better. We think that is a core part of what journalism is there to do when we serve people. Um, and we think it's our job to celebrate good ideas about how things could be different. And so that's why we've teamed up with University College London to launch a competition for students aged 14 and over. And we're asking them to tell us their ideas about what the world should be like post COVID and how we get there. Um, so we're looking for a mix of imagination, creativity, but also um, concrete ideas or plans um, that maybe haven't been thought of before. And all my panelists today have kindly agreed to judge this competition. There have been some absolutely fantastic entries so far. I'd really encourage you, whether you are a student, whether you're eligible or not, to go and check them out because they are so inspiring. Um, and obviously to enter if, if you've got a good idea and, and, and you qualify. Um, but um, have a look at opendemocracy.net forward slash world after COVID, if you just want five minutes of inspiration or if you're thinking that you have an idea that you want to share. Um, today, the panelists are, are going to dig a little bit into their visions of the world post COVID um, and also explore the kinds of approaches that they'll be looking for as judges. So that's what we're going to be uh, talking about. Um, there's some housekeeping. We want this conversation to involve all of you. And thank you so much to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. We'll try and get to as many of those as we can. If you're joining us on Zoom, you have a question or comment, you can um, click um, either in the Q&A box or the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining on Facebook, you can add your input and it'll be fed back. Um, uh, the, the, the normal disclaimer, which is that these discussions happen in lockdown or semi-lockdown, um, so there may be unscheduled interruptions from pets um, or small children on, or other things. Um, and uh, please bear with us if any of those things happen. This is, this is the, the world and that we live in and the life that we lead now. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's panel. Um, we have Adam Habib, who's Professor of Political Science and Vice-Chancellor and Principal at the University of, of WIT, as you put it, <laughs> um, and incoming Director of the SOAS University at, at Lon uh, in London. Um, and we have Hannah Marcus, who's Assistant Professor in the Department of History of, of Science at Harvard University. Um, and we have Adam Wagner, who's um, a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers, which I know to be an awesome human rights um, firm, uh, amongst other things. And he's a visiting professor at Goldsmiths University and specialist advisor to the Joint Committee on Human Rights Inquiry into COVID-19. Um, and we have Leah Boat, who is a um, biological sciences student at Un U University College London now, and she's the project leader of the London COVID-19 Care Central. So we couldn't have a better lineup for the discussion today. Um, thank you all so much for joining. And uh, perhaps predictably, Hannah, I'm gonna start with you because you're the history expert here. Um, you're an expert on early modern Europe and your first book was called Forbidden Knowledge, Medicine, Science and Censorship in Early Modern Italy. <laughs> so um, I'd love to hear just quickly, why was medicine and science forbidden and uh, forbidden knowledge back then? Uh, tell us some of the most extraordinary things that came out in, in that book that people used to believe or the ways that they um, used to get around the restrictions. Um, and of course, I'm, I would invite you to draw parallels with today. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to all of you who are tuning in. Um, I, I really, in my more optimistic moments, I hope that this uh, pandemic can be like a catalyst for change in our communities and our society. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what all of your ideas are. Um, from the perspective of the past, from a past, I, I'm an expert in early modern Europe and, and especially in Italy. Um, I study, my first book is on the history of censorship. So I, I became interested in how it is that um, forbidden knowledge circulated in uh, the period after the Italian Renaissance, after the Reformation. And, and sort of the story behind this has always been like the Galileo story, like the church hates science. Um, Galileo is a martyr to science. Um, and that seemed both, uh, it just seemed overly simplistic to me as I'd been reading the story and learning more about it. And I also became very interested in how cases beyond the case of Galileo played out. And so I, I went into the archives, the archives of the Roman Inquisition, uh, now called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. If any of you like, can imagine St. Peter's, right, that big round colisade, um, it's on the, the left-hand side, the entrance to the archive. Um, so I was going in there and I was reading about censorship cases and, uh, and medicine came up over and over again as this case where all of these medical books are prohibited uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries because their authors are Protestant. So because of the people who are speaking, uh, I, I argue that it's not about the ideas in the books yet. It's just about the who's, who is speaking. Um, and basically this sets off a huge furor that people, physicians in Italy are like, we can't medicate without Fuchs. We need Gessner. These guys that you prohibited, they have nothing to do with religion. They have everything to do with medicine and we have to be able to read them in order to take care of the people here. Um, so that started out my interest and I followed it through all sorts of different archives, looking at people and how they um, participate in the system of censorship uh, that gets set up by the Catholic Church, how they work against it also, how books get like physically altered, names crossed out, pages torn up, um, and how these ideas about uh, forbidden knowledge and permissible knowledge are sort of have a lot more gray area than, uh, than the traditional story of Galileo leads us to think. So then <laughs> I'm going to lead, if I can, Mary, I'm going to go into COVID here for a second. Yeah. Um, so I was designing a class last winter, um, last fall and winter uh, for my the first year students at Harvard. Um, and, uh, and it's on science and censorship in like a long context. So from the Middle Ages to the present. And I was watching the news every day and I was like, whoa, there's some real science and censorship going on with this case of the, the new coronavirus, right? We were seeing over and over again the, um, the conversations about how knowledge about this new virus was getting, coming up against the, the great firewall, right? The Chinese censorship apparatus. Um, and I was like, well, wouldn't this make an interesting case study for my class? This was December, right? December and early January, where it seemed like it could be a somewhat abstract case study from the world that we live in. Um, and, and so I'd been thinking a lot about the ways in which like public health and, and censorship intersect. I've been reading a lot in, in the early modern historical record about how it's really common for cities, for states to hide outbreaks in early stages. I don't know if that made me feel comforted about what's happened here, but I just, I, I, I felt some real resonance to things that have happened in the past, outbreaks of plague that people um, were unwilling to admit to because they didn't want to ruin the economy. Um, that like, while every sort of historical moment is, is unique in its ways, there are ways that, um, that we can see real resonances between past and present. And I think that that's, um, the COVID pandemic is really bringing that out. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think there, I, what I would pick up on, because obviously a lot of what we focus on is misinformation. Um, mm -hmm. So there's obviously there's the question of the fact that um, at, at first the news of this virus was suppressed and that severity was suppressed, which is something that has happened in outbreaks, you know, immemorial. Um, but also there's an interesting dimension around this, which is now um, 
fascinating to me because there's misinformation being spread about the virus and um, I think it plays a lot on um, mistrust of authority which is actually grounded in some pretty reasonable assumptions given track record right um, so I, I guess the question for you is what lessons have we failed to learn from history and, and how could the lessons that from history that, that you know of um, be applied better as we move forward from this crisis so thinking about the theme of the competition looking ahead yeah I think everybody, the, the, the thing that I really worry about right now um, is that we are failing to see this pandemic as a, a long-term situation that we really desperately want it to be over. Um, and so our planning is often sort of short-term solutions. And I think the reality is um, when plague hit the world in 1340 five, six in, in China, Mongolia, the 47, 48 in Europe. Um, so about 700 years ago, that started off a series of outbreaks like the plague become, and to be clear, we're glad that this isn't plague. This is really bad, but plague is really, really bad. Um, just the, the etiologies of these diseases are quite distinct. Um, we're talking about in medieval Europe, like 50% of the population being wiped out in a period of a few years. Um, but plague becomes endemic in Europe. This becomes a part of how people live. There are new sort of economic life like cycles. There are new I, I, situations around travel and trade of public health measures spring up. Quarantine comes, like quarantine as a public health solution happens because of plague. It comes from the Venetian word for 40 days. Um, which is how long people had to be uh, set apart, goods had to be set apart. So I just, I think it's really important as we think about moving forward, I think one of the lessons to learn from the past is that we should be thinking about sort of a new set of long-term solutions to how we live in a changed globe. Thank you. Yeah, and there's much to take from there about particularly the way we travel and the way we live. Um, that... And this is not divorced from ideas about climate change. I think this is mm -hmm. a, a moment to tackle climate, to like really think hard about climate change and the ways in which we as organisms are participating in, uh, in, in, in the changing nature of our planet right now. I think that we're traveling more and more, we're moving around more and more, the viruses are as well. These are, these are not um, isolated uh, accidents. And, and yet we can be as connected as we are now without moving, <laughs> which was not the case in any previous um, plague, right? Um, yeah. And that's something to reflect on. And, you know, for people listening and thinking about joining the competition, I'd really encourage ideas on, on that front about how we stay um, connected and creative and um, interdependent while, um, while not moving. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Adam uh, Wagner, I'm going to come to you now. Um, and uh, I mean, again, sort of drawing on um, the experience that open democracy is having <laughs> um, and the things we're learning in our journalism. I mean, so many companies and governments seem to think that this is just a great moment to abuse or rewrite laws in their favor <laughs> or just ignore them and pretend, pretend that they aren't happening, right? So recently um, at Open Democracy, we had to threaten to sue the British government just to get them to tell us what they're doing with our health data, right? They, they signed these massive contracts with big um, private tech firms, the, the NHS signed these massive contracts and they just didn't wanna tell us we have freedom of information laws and they were just refusing to hand the information over. We had to threaten to sue them to get it um, just hours before we were gonna issue proceedings. Um, they, they caved and they gave us the documents. We're going through the documents now. Doesn't look good, I have to tell you. Um, my colleague, Adam Bukowski can share our latest reporting in the chat not a good scene there at all and there's more coming um but um, i think that one of the things uh i'm curious uh to ask you about is um you know where are you seeing that happening you know where are you seeing laws and things being trampled on and um you know you you've got you host the better humans podcast where you've been interviewing lots of legal experts who are quite frankly furious about some of the things that are happening so give us a flavor of what they've been saying and what you've been putting up yeah, well, thanks so much for having me, um, Mary, and, and Open Democracy. And I'm, I'm really um, looking forward to reading um, the entries to this competition, which, you know, for, for a bit of hope, maybe, in this kind of difficult time. Um, I, th I think the, in, the answer to your question is, this is, it, it, the way I see this entire sort of crisis, and it is an enormous crisis nationally, internationally, um, I, across almost the whole of society, you know, that so many parts of society are affected by this. The way I see it in, from the 
human rights perspective is this is a, a stress test. It's the biggest stress test we've had in the world for a very, very long time of these institutions and structures and laws and cultures that we've tried to put in place, um, particularly after the Second World War. And after, and if you think about where, uh, where we were, where the world was in 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was um, brought into being by most of the nations in the world, we just experienced two, uh, the, the two worst wars um, in hum human history. We'd had the, um, the, Dep the Great Depression, the greatest depression of all time. Um, and we'd also had the Spanish flu, which was, the, which was potentially the first sort of truly globalized pandemic, which killed up to 50 million, maybe even more people. Um, and, and that, you know, killed more people than the First World War. And if you, if you read the, the, the human rights instruments in that context, you can see um, that these are not sort of utopian visions for a world that didn't exist. They were an attempt to just boil down the essential needs of every human being um, to ensure that the, the things that we'd seen happen during these enormous crises weren't repeated, whether you know, at the most extreme end, the genocide that we'd seen, but also extreme um, aggressive war, um, sort of these, these uncontrollable, this uncontrollable pandemic, this um, destructive depression, you know, and, and, and the, the, the reason for these, this moment of clarity, as, as I think of it, was the, an attempt by the world to, to say, there must be a way we can do things differently because we keep making the same mistakes. Every time we have enormous social upheaval, the same things happen. Um, unpopular minorities get abused, persecuted, murdered. Um, the, the poorest people, the most vulnerable, vulnerable people are the ones that lose out immediately. We hunker down, we, we attack each other um, because we, we lose trust in each other. And, and I think that vision um, is the vision that I, I see as the human rights vision. And then you then, looking at this crisis, you have a useful overlay to apply to this crisis to say, well, you know, how is how are we doing with the rule of law? You know, the, the right to a fair trial, just to take an example from the lockdown laws, the right to know the criminal law that's being put in place so you can predict how your behavior is going to contravene it or not. Um, so I'm, I'm in the UK where we've had these this sort of strange spectacle of lockdown laws that apply to 65 million people being brought in by government dictates, um, you know, without parliamentary approval, without um, parliamentary debate, it's set much further in the future. And they're usually brought in on a kind of Sunday afternoon before Monday morning when they start to apply. Um, people have no idea how they're going to, whether their basic human social interactions are going to breach the, 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 um, the criminal law. Then you have the, the issue, Mary, that, that you mentioned, the, the rights privacy issues around these enormous um, projects to share our, our medical data, our health data. Um, and I'm, I'm not a sort of data skeptic in the sense that I, I believe that the state in some situations should be um, using mass data to assist in the preventing the spread of a pandemic, a deadly disease. You know, human rights laws protect the right to life um, fundamentally. And they, and they really, you know, if you think that the Spanish flu happened 25 years before all of these human rights instruments came into play. The World Health Organization mentions um, uh, human rights in its charter. It's all interlinked. Um, so I, I think there are appropriate ways to do that. But the problem here, I think the main problem has been the speed at which all of these um, changes to our rules and laws and um, ba the basic principles of good governance has, has happened. And in that sense, it really is a stress test for the checks and balances we've put into place. And I would want to see um, in the thinking of the, you know, some of the thinking going into these works that people will submit, how can we strengthen those checks and balances um, ba based on learning from what we've seen during this pandemic? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will, I guess I'll move you on a little bit to that, which is, um, I mean, it's early days, right? But what are you seeing um, that, you, that you think does give you hope? That, you know, what are the, some of the most innovative and kind of cool ways that um, people have been using the law to fight back, to challenge, to clarify, to improve, to strengthen our rule of law? Uh, this question, um, which I think is not hopeful from one of our um, audience members, which is, um, 
uh, will the UK learn from its mistakes with COVID-19 to communicate properly with other countries and not be exceptionalist? <laughs> um, but you know, <laughs> maybe you can deal with that as well as sort of what, what, you know, what's, what's giving you hope or what do you think might be interesting that emerges from this that's different? Um, well, I have to admit, not a huge amount has given me hope during the last three months. It's been a bit, um, it's been a very dark period um, for, for, I just speak from the UK, I think it's, it's just been a very, very dark period. Um, we've lost 60,000, 65,000 lives. Um, I, I, I'll stay in my lane and not talk about the, the government, the, the government response directly. But in terms of the, the rule of law side, the human rights side, I mean, one slight ray of hope is I've seen the, the the people in the kind of human rights community if I put it like I'm not even sure I like that expression very much but civil society um, in all the different areas whether it's um, organizations specializing in stop and search or healthcare rights or elderly rights or um, disability rights you know they've they've stood up and they've stepped up to this kind of torrent it's almost an uncontrollable torrent of new laws of new policies of changes um, and and also and, and i make sort of a slightly a, a point which may um may great with some people I, as somebody who's um who didn't vote for this government and you know and I, I don't particularly like this government i have been quite encouraged in some senses to see how they've they seem to not, there's certain aspects of the response, such as furlough, the furloughing scheme, um, such as the free school meals, although, you know, they, um, had to be, they had to be pushed hard to get to, to renew it, um, such as the, uh, the, some of the educational schemes, the tutoring, the laptops, et cetera, that I've been working on um, through litigation. The, the, this government, I don't think has been rigidly ideological. I think it's been, it's been open at the very least to um, thinking from different sides of the political spectrum and um, people may vehemently disagree with me that on that point but I do see that as a slight point of hope that it hasn't been that I, I really you know it worries me to think what say Margaret Thatcher would have done in this situation like would the furlough scheme have been available you know have been even a thought in that sense so maybe that's something to discuss. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, all bets are off, right? That, that things that you never would expect from governments or from other actors have, have suddenly started to happen and people have started thinking differently about, idea, you know, big ideas to do with climate or the investment income or whatever it might be. Um, I think that's certainly true, although it's, yeah, we can have a debate about what merits of the UK um, policy, you know, which, which won't, won't, won't feel very global. Um, but actually, actually I can hear myself echoing a bit. Adam, you mute when you're not talking. Adam W, thank you. Um, uh, I will I'll pick some of that up, but I actually, um, you know, keeping with the hope thread um, and picking up some hope here and, and making it more global again. Adam Habib, you're joining us from South Africa, where at your university, they have just started trying the first coronavirus vaccines. So can you tell us some more about that? I think we'd all like to hear about that. So perhaps uh, let me start. Well, firstly, let me thank you for, for, for inviting me to be part of this panel and for I'm looking forward to engaging some of the proposal and the ideas. I perhaps should start off with something that Hannah spoke about and that she raised the issue of that this pandemic, this virus is not going to be with us in the short term. It's here for a, for a while. That's what our medical scientists are telling us. This is going to be around for a couple of years. And what that suggests to us is that actually the development of a vaccine is going to be very, very important for sustainably addressing the COVID-19 crisis. And, and, and I think that's important and that's something that we need to confront it on. But what makes me particularly excited about this is that WITS is involved in this first trial on the African continent, but it's doing it in partnership with other institutions around the world. It's doing it in partnership with uh, colleagues in Oxford. It's doing it in partnership with colleagues in other parts of Europe and Brazil and in, and in, and in, uh, and in the United States. And I think it's important to say that, you know, the, the, the challenges of our world are transnational in character. That's what this pandemic tells us. And if we're going to address the challenges of our world, 
we need to have great science and great technology and local context and understanding. It's bringing the two together that's going to allow us to address the challenges of our world. And what we're doing with this intervention is we taking a global challenge, the COVID-19 pandemic, and we bringing institutions from around the world, from across national and institutional and continental boundaries, across the North-South divide to create solutions for the globe. And that's what excites me about this. So yes, we're working towards the testing and the development of a vaccine. But what it is, is it's pioneering a practice that's saying, if we truly see ourselves as a connected world, then we need to reimagine how we do good science, how we link global partnerships, how do we institutionally ground them, so that, frankly, we develop world-class uh, solutions that are contextually grounded uh, in our world. And that's what we're doing. This is why we're testing not only in the middle of Oxford, but we're testing in the US and in Brazil and in South Africa and in multiple other parts of the world because we're pioneering a new practice. And so for me, that's it. The vaccine's exciting, but it's the pioneering practice that we, we're thinking through. And I think that's what we need to talk about far more. No, thank you. That, that, uh, that leads on long to my next question brilliantly, which is actually a question um, from the audience, absolutely about pioneering in, in universities. Um, th this person says, my generation often agitates for a better world. Without, I'm assuming this person is, is young. My generation often agitates for a better world without a clear sense of what that looks like. Can imagination be taught in higher education? So I'm going to ask you, Adam, but I'm also going to ask you, Hannah, since you're both resident in faculties. So uh, let me start by saying, I also come from a generation that agitated a lot. So agitation is not peculiar uh, to a younger generation. It is part of all generations. But you know, I carry on engaging and I have sometimes fairly robust co uh, conversations with young activists. And I, my argument with them in part is fundamental transformation, fundamental change needs to be a thoughtful process. It can't simply be uh, agitation. It needs to be thinking, how do we transcend of our, our world? How do we think through how we navigate power relations in our societies? How do we navigate? Because whether you like it or not, in every one of our societies, there are people who are interested in change, and there will be people who are very powerful who are interested in the status quo. And you can rave at them and rant at them, but you've got to think through in a strategic way how to navigate that world. And it seems to me that imagination is absolutely essential in this. And the thing about imagination is, yes, you can teach some of it in the classroom, but most of it you teach outside the classroom. You know, the great thing about universities is not what you only learn in the classroom. It's what you learn outside the classroom, what you learn from your peers, what you learn from a diverse local community that allows you to navigate a world beyond race and beyond class and beyond religion and beyond culture. And it's that ability to navigate. So for me, yes, imagination is central. It's fundamental to transforming your world. Yes, you can learn part of it through effectively the classroom like Hannah spoke about learning best practices from other epochs. But what you also need to learn from it is to practice. It's through the practice of engaging with each other, learning from each other, interacting and navigating a cosmopolitan power ridden world and trying to say, how do I navigate this? But with an eye to social justice. And I think that's what the lesson is. Thank you so much. I mean, what you said just reminded me, I used to work at Avaz, the um, global campaigning organization. And one of the things we were taught as um, campaigners as a tactic was to put yourself completely in the shoes of your target. You're trying to get a law changed. You're trying to get justice done. You have to think like the person who wants to stop it. Um, and you really have to understand and listen to their perspective, where they're coming from, what they're going to worry about, what their context is because that's the only way you're ever gonna be able to persuade the person, the organization, the movement, the legislature, whatever it is, you have to 
deeply put yourself in their shoes and understand what makes them tick, who they listen to, what their experiences are formed by, and that's the only way you can be effective as an advocate. So I think, and yeah, that's an exercise in imagination as well. And, and it's something that takes some learning and practice, but, um, but I very much enjoyed. Um, Hannah, I'm going to come to you next to ask, answer the same question. And then Leah, I really, I've got tons of questions for you, including this one. So um, hold up, hold up. Thank you. I wanted to really second um, sort of Adam's perspective, Adam Habib's perspective on this. Um, I'd also add that something I've been reflecting on a lot as a historian is that I'm um, rereading books that I've read before about things that happened a long time ago, and I'm seeing them really differently in uh, in this moment from amid a pandemic, from amid major social upheaval about what I would call an epidemic of police violence against black people in the United States. Um, I think that one of the things that young people uh, bring to my classroom and bring to the world is a fresh perspective on living in a moment. You've lived in a few fewer moments um, than, than those of us who have few more moments behind us. Um, but those are, those are the moments that you own. And I think that that perspective that you bring to things that we know well already um, causes us to see things, the world very differently. Um, and I, I've chosen to like approach this from the perspective of a book that I've read many times that now I see uh, new resonances, new, um, new lessons from. But I think that that's true for any aspect of our societies right now, that we can all benefit from, uh, from the energy and the insights that you bring and apply to systems that are pre-existing and, and to, to revising those systems as well. Thank you. And, and Leah, I've got lots of questions for you. I think I, I will start with the, with the question about how, how you can learn or develop imagination in higher education. Um, you're, you're studying biology at UCL and you're leading London COVID-19 Care Centre, so I want to come to that. But first, the question of imagination. Uh, yeah, well, I love what you were saying because I think for a lot of, I mean, for myself and a lot of my peers, we often have a lot of ideas about the way we're perceiving the world. Um, and it comes from a place of emotion and passion and oftentimes anger just because, like you said, I mean, we're experiencing a lot of this for the first time. And a discussion I have at the dinner table with my parents all the time is they're like, you were so idealistic and explosive. Um, and I think the importance of imagination, but also just access to education um, is sort of being more mindful about how to displace that passion and how to turn that into something that is more concrete. Um, because, I mean, interacting with a lot of my peers and everyone's very much engaged with, with what's happening in the world and trying to figure out what we can do about it. And oftentimes I think we feel really small compared to the magnitude of a global pandemic and also all these intersectional issues on society that you've been talking about. It's like, what are we as students or what are we as young people supposed to do against institutional structures um, that are creating these inequalities or these problems? And I think what you say about the importance of imagination and also just thoughtfulness in this approach is the difference between pointless idealism and turning your emotion into change. Um, so one of the things I'm most excited about the competition is how people can put on their personal lenses to this experiences, but also I think um, just the access to the information that they're gonna be getting from open democracy and then the expertise that everyone provides. Like I'm so honored to be here. I, <laughs> I feel so, um, unqualified but also honored and excited and i think like um yeah just <laughs> a lot of excitement we're honored to have you and um i wanted to hear a bit more about london covid19 care central as well can you tell us a little bit more about what that initiative is um yeah so it's a student initiative and the initial idea was to provide information and also a sense of community for students so it's on social media and then we upload sort of coverage of the pandemic and encourage people to share their stories and the student perspective to how we're absorbing this. And it has become something 
I mean, one of the things I'm very excited about it is how reactive it is. Because what we're learning from the pandemic is it's highlighting a lot of institutionalized problems. Um, and we can't ignore the fact that those problems are interconnected with the pandemic. So for example, we did a feature recently on um, the Black Lives Matter movement in response to the murder of George Floyd and how COVID-19 has been disproportionately affect affecting Black and minority ethnic groups in the UK. And I think one of the things we wanna do with COVID care is to establish that the pandemic is not just a healthcare one and that we are doing a disservice to ourselves by not considering the incredible intersectionality um, of all these problems. And so that's the kind of thing we've been working on. So we did a feature recently on like um, the crisis in Yemen and how that's been aggravated by the pandemic as well. But we also share stories of students and like how they're dealing with lockdown and how to save money or <laughs> how to manage your time in online classes. Um, yeah, it's pretty much just a student platform in that. Um, there, there's a, a suggestion which was uh, submitted ahead of time and I'm sure that one of the things um, that uh, must be a source of anxiety for many people that you, um, uh, many of your uh, student colleagues and, and people you know, um, is the fact that we are going to see joblessness on a scale that we haven't seen in Britain since the um, early 90s. Um, and that I remember as a child kind of seeing on, on, on TV screens and none of you guys will remember at all. Um, and and that, that must be creating a lot of, of, of anxiety. And one of the suggestions that someone added ahead of time was, should the, work, should the working age demographic be brought down to enable more employment for younger people, e.g. by reducing retirement ages? Now I can see how that has benefits for everyone. <laughs> and, 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 and so I just, I'm curious, so that's one suggestion, but I mean, what else, uh, if, if that's been a topic of not the retirement specifically, but if that, that sort of looking to ahead to the future and the anxiety around the, the way the world is gonna be structured and the opportunities available, if there are other ideas like that that have been generated or what you think about that idea in particular? Um, I think that's interesting because for me, I'm studying biology at uni and I've always wanted to go into research and stuff anyway. So for my personal, um, I guess trajectory, I think I'm even more excited for the opportunities that would open up because we're realizing just how important both scientific development is and also just the scale and the collaboration required for um, efficient scientific progress. I think maybe the question or the, the solution that it highlights is how to make jobs more accessible for all fields. Um, and I think what we're realizing, like what I was talking about um, regarding the intersectionality is that science and scientific development is important, but a lot of other problems in society relating to other sectors are being highlighted as well. And like, I mean, I hope that um, young people coming out of university will have a fresh perspective on that and more of a desire to tackle those problems. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, well, yes, po pointing to the in, uh, intersectionality point and also to the, the, to the things that um, Adam Habib was talking about, about collaboration and, um, you know, sort of the scale of, of what we're dealing with now requires, at the very least, kind of interdisciplinary approaches, right? Um, you, um, you know, as a biologist, you know, an assignment for you would not be the job of writing a blog or submitting a short film or an image, which is what we're looking for in, in this competition. And I would really encourage people to go and, and look at the things that have already been submitted because they are fascinating and beautiful. Um, but if you were going to apply your discipline to this challenge, right, if you were going to apply um, uh, what you're learning as a biologist, to, to the challenge of the competition. Obviously you can't enter the competition because you're a judge. But, um, but you know, what type of thing would you be submitting and sort of how would uh, people in, in your field um, communicate their ideas about in, in this form for contributing a better world post COVID? Um, well, I think one of the interesting things about how we're approaching uh, the treatment to um, the coronavirus is that not only are we working on developing new vaccines, but we're also exploring the use of existing antivirals and existing treatments and how those can be used for this as well. So I think that's a really interesting front from that, just how we can learn and take from what's existing. 
and use that for our benefit. I think that's something I would find interesting. Um, but also like I'm interested not just in the science and I think the perspective that I would bring and a lot of young people would bring would also involve their identity as students and as people sort of having to navigate what it now looks like to learn online or to be at home when you expected to be at university. And that poses an entirely different set of problems that are not even necessarily related to my field. So solutions on like online learning, for example, I think a lot of my peers and myself find it ineffective. Um, how can we learn from that? And if the world after COVID looks less interconnected, how can we make schools as effective as they were if we were doing them in person um, is also something I've been thinking about and would be excited to see people respond to. Um, thank you, yes, as the parent of young children who has struggled with Google Classroom, I second that. <laughs> I creeped out with I, I, the idea of Google being my classroom and it doesn't work. <laughs> so there's the sort of baseline doesn't function and then there's the, the sort of scarier surveillance part of that. So I'm definitely <laughs> interested in hearing more about that. Adam Wagner, I'm gonna come back to you um, because we've heard less, less from you than um, from others. And I wanted to ask you, um, I mean, you're, as a judge, what are you going to be looking for? And um, what, what would you really encourage people to be thinking about and challenging, challenging themselves on um, from, from your perspective? Adam, are you there? Ah. S sorry, yeah, no, I am. Okay. I got, I, the other Adam. <laughs> All right, sorry, do you want me to ask a question again? Um, no, I, 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 in terms of what, what I'm looking for um, as a judge, I, I, I think, I, I think we're in a period of history that we don't, we don't really have the, almost the language to understand yet. Um, I think things have happened so quickly and, and to such a, we've, ch things have changed so quickly and particularly in, in, I think this applies particularly to countries that haven't experienced recent um, epidemics. Um, I think, you know, I, I speak from the UK, I, I think maybe things are, are slightly different in parts of the world that, you know, have very, have had different, have had bad outbreaks of Ebola or SARS or, or MERS. Um, but overall, I think we, we are in a different world. Um, and the, what I would be looking for is a, an articulation, first of all, of what that, what that different world is. You know, what has changed? I think it's really hard to be in the, in the situation, we're still in it, and we're still in the crisis, to really get a grip on what we, um, what's happening. And I think visionaries are people who can, can step back um, from the current and see, see it for what it is or what it will become. And I'd want to see a bit of sort of visionary thinking. And then I think once you describe the world as it's changed, it becomes much easier to extrapolate what can, what could happen or what, what should happen next. Um, and I find it very difficult, you know, I, I cling on to the human rights framework, you know, because that's my, it's almost like my comfort blanket to be able to describe, you know, oh, well, the, the schools have all shut down. <laughs> for months you know my, my I've got young children as well in fact my daughter went back to school for the first time in three and a half months today and it is just a very strange thing that's happening what does the right what does that mean for the right to education the right to education which has only ever in in human rights law been really about um giving people education without discrimination because it's always been there's always been the availability of schools at the very least um, and this idea there isn't the availability of physical schools um, and this online education, which there, which is meant to be a replacement is no replacement or very, it's a, it's an insipid kind of replacement. How, what does that mean? Like, how can we think, what does that right to education mean now um, in the context of a world where it may not be possible for the next year or two or even longer to guarantee physical locational education? Um, just as an example. So what, what does it, what does that mean? And, and, and how can it, how can we um, find a way through it um, and learn from it? So I'm, I'm really looking for some people who have that sort of extra visionary 
approach to the what was happening at the moment help me understand it um, would be you know on a basic level thank you yeah that's 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 very rich uh, food for thought for any um aspiring entrance um i think that's very very helpful um another comment from the audience which is um these panelists have really optimistic expectations of the future the economic crisis that is expected to start a few months later might be really huge unemployment transformation probably the digitalization um, you know, so uh, are we being too lofty in, in, in the way we think about things? And, and then there's also a very uh, related question, which is how will the world of work change? So Adam made a very good point about education um, and how should it change? So I'm going to put that to any panelist who wants to put their hand up really to, to respond um, to those uh, related questions. Yes, Adam Habib, you were first off the block. So I wanted to say uh, two things. One is, you know, I'm, I'm not that optimistic. I think that we are in a seriously dangerous moment in history. I think that uh, our world is deeply unequal. And as a result, it is incredibly socially and politically polarized. And the real danger with that is that so long as we socially and politically polarized, we can't rise to address the global challenges. That's the foundation on which you can create a cohesive global community to address the challenges. If you don't cohere as a global community, there is no capacity to be able to make the kinds of trade-offs to understand that. So the first thing that I wanted to say is what I'm looking for is not simply a technological or scientific imagination. I'm looking for a technological and scientific imagination that allows us to address that very deep inequality. So you could find technological solutions post COVID-19 on online that can deepen the economic divides. You can say to poor people, okay, we'll give you online education and we'll give you rich people. You go to Harvard and Oxford and get trained there in a face-to-face -face interaction. That deepens the economic divide and it will deepen the social and political. So what we've got to think of is a technical, a, a technological and scientific imagination that is socially grounded, that is grounded in healing our world. And I think that that's something that I would love to look at and I'd love to, to think through. I also think it's going to have to deal with the issue of work. So why do we, for instance, in the UK, you have a 35 hour week or a 37 and a half hour week. In South Africa, we have a 40 hour week. What's so magical about 40 hours or 37 and a half hours? Who concocted this? And it popped up in the particular historical moment post World War II because of a particular economic model. We need to reimagine that. Why not say it should be 25 hours and 25 hours is mandatory of voluntary learning in the arts and in higher education for all ages. And that fundamentally changes our world. It forces men to, to share their duties at home in a far more substantive way. If we need to reimagine post COVID-19, not in a scientific and technological sense, but in one that is also grounded in a more socially constructed, more inclusive world. Thank you so much. And Adam, you actually, um, someone was saying uh, something very similar in, in, the, in the chat just now, um, which is, I think it's important that more scientists don't just apply the technical knowledge to solving health problems, but call out the problem of the dom dominant narrative that sacralizes scientific solutions to solve so social problems like health inequity, for example. Um, uh, this implicit norm among health scientists limits our ability to imagine solutions to solve social problems, which is, uh, touches on what a lot of what you said. And I also wanted to point to um, a really, really thoughtful long piece that was written by our um, Open Democracy's founder, Anthony Barnett, um, which is uh, called um, Out to the Belly of Hell, the Shutdown and the Humanization of Globalization. Right, throughout, throughout my life, globalization or neoliberalism or whatever you want to call it, has just been the assumed norm. It's been, it's been so dominant that until recently it wasn't even named. Um, and, and that makes all kinds of assumptions um, about the ways um, that people um, and communities and groups and companies and governments would behave in a moment like this. 
all kinds of actually negative assumptions. And what's really fascinating is that, and this is something that Anthony explores at length in a sort of very long, thoughtful 20,000 word piece, but that actually when it really, when, when it really came to the crunch, um, people and communities and some companies and governments behave very differently from the way you'd ex you would expect neoliberal logic would, would expect them to behave. Um, and so that opens up some really vast and sort of fascinating possibilities about where we go next. And um, yeah, I'd encourage everyone to, to read that as well. And, and Anthony can, can share it in the chat since I think he's on, on this. Um, does anyone else want to come? Yeah, Hannah had her hand up. We've only got a few more minutes, but, but yeah, go ahead, Hannah. I, I just want to also clarify that this is not a moment of optimism for me. <laughs> um, and, and I just think that, but I, but I also think that that's not a reason to recede from the world either, right? I, um, I study the history of science. There have been a lot of terrible things done in the name of science, Ma like massive infections of populations as a result of forced, kind of forced regimes, eugenics, for example, I just published a piece on eugenics the other day, forced sterilization of individuals, not to mention genocide, but these are based in scientific ideas. Um, science is always in a society and it's always grounded in a set of values of the society that it's in. I think that one of the things that I really really hope for from these um, from these submissions is in part the acknowledgement of a way of engaging with um, a scientific world that is uh, both global and profoundly local at the same time, which is again sort of echoing something that Adam Habib mentioned earlier, um, which is that any sort of solution to a massive uh, issue like the pandemic is going to have to happen on local on, on local levels. Uh, that engage with but are different from uh, a sort of vast sweeping uh, uniform response. And so I really want to see participants um, in their local context as part of this. And that's something I believe in as a historian. I think that we can't, uh, my, my own brand of history is that we don't understand history just from like reading uh, economic data about a history of demographic numbers. Like that, that, that doesn't tell us, deaths doesn't tell us what happened in plague, what happened in plague uh during plague outbreaks is the experiences of people who lived it and so i want to see the experiences of you who are living it and i want to encourage us to realize both that like that this is not an optimistic moment but that it's also but that we can't back away from the tools that we have either that we're going to keep living in this world we might as well um use this as a moment to come together to to make things better in ways that we can Thank you, Hannah. Leah, I'm going to give you the last word to shout out to um, fellow students and young people. Anything else you'd want to say to just encourage people or, or spark their imaginations? Uh, thank you. Um, I like what you were just saying, Hannah, about how um, this is our moment. I think like as students, a lot of the time we learn about history and then we say that was a terrible thing. How are these people complicit to what was happening in history? But we're living, I think, in a really big turning point for us as a society and something that will be a big part of our history because it's of something that's of such global scale and of such massive impact. And I think this is that moment that if you've ever sat in history class and thought, why were those people complicit to the injustices of the world? Or why did those people not speak out or try to do something about how terrible all these things are? This is our chance. And I think what we're doing with a competition and opening up to students is to say, like, this is your moment to say something and try to make sure that the world where we grow up is not the same one that we're living in. Because we're angry, all of us are seeing these problems and we're responding on social media and we're engaging our peers and talking about it at home. But then, and then it comes to like, what are we gonna do about it? And this is just one opportunity, but it's also the beginning of um, the discussion and like what we were talking about imagination and understanding just having a better understanding of the world that we're living in and of the inequalities that we should no longer tolerate <laughs> I think like just sorry about the inequality thing um, like I come from the Philippines and a lot of the people I mean a large part of the population live under poverty and so um, the problem that happened when people were being placed on lockdown is how are people going to feed themselves? And then how are the government going to treat people who are sneaking out of quarantine because they can't work or they can't feed themselves? Um, 
And these are problems that the pandemic highlights that again makes it so important for us to understand we're not just solving a healthcare issue. And I think the things that students should be submitting should be grounded in the reality of all these inequalities and how important it is to tackle them together, I think. Um, but yeah, this is our moment. <laughs> I guess that's my, that's my two cents. Thank you so much, Leah. That was an excellent way to wrap up. And actually what you just said then made me think as well that people are looking for inspiration or, or, or challenge um, to look as well at Open Democracy's Humans of COVID project, which is um, um, bringing, um, lifting up voices um, of people who um, are particularly vulnerable or marginalized or challenged during the pandemic, but, but were so before, right? The inequalities already existed, right? They were, lot, they were longstanding. Um, and their situation is maybe exacerbated or changed by the pandemic. But the point is that this is not just something that suddenly happened. So I'd encourage people to look at that. And I would really encourage everyone to share um, the page. So it's opendemocracy.net slash forward slash world after COVID. Um, you know, don't be, don't be shy, do enter and do encourage others uh, to enter um, because we wanna hear from as many of you as possible. I wanna say thank you so much to all the panelists today. This has been a fantastic discussion and I think hopefully very inspiring for people who are listening in and who are thinking um, about these questions um, that are thrown up by uh, by this competition and 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 by um, the problems it's it's trying to begin to to tackle um, uh, yeah uh, obviously if you're not signed up to our newsletter already um, sign up opendemocracy.net forward slash newsletter and um, you can hear more about the competition and about all the work we're doing. If you thought this was a good panel and you think public interest journalism should be supported, you can do that at support.opendemocracy.net forward slash donate. <laughs> um, that's always my job to say that, that bit, but um, I really just wanted to thank all of you for your time today and everyone who's been joining us from all across the world. Uh, we've had hundreds of people listening in um, from all across the planet and um, please share this. Um, this discussion can be downloaded afterwards. So please share it with anyone else who you think needs to be listening in and um, might be inspired by it and um, thank you all so much have wonderful afternoons mornings evenings depending on where you are in the world thank goodbye you. everyone thank bye. you bye bye